Welcome to PM Express Business Edition. Well, some time ago, the Securities and Exchange Commission went out to identify some firms that have actually gone against the rules to be in business. These firms were actually liquidated. Well, today on PM Express Business Edition, we are tracking the revocation process. Why were these firms identified to go down? Where are we right now? And how are they working to ensure that individuals who are affected get their monies back on time? All these things wrapped up on PM Express Business Edition right here. We'll be right back after this commercial break. Welcome back to PM Express Business Edition as we track the regulation process. And I'm here with Reverend Daniel Obamitete. He's the Director General of the Securities and Exchange Commission. And also grateful to be joined by the Registrar General, and she's also joining us in this whole discussion. When it comes to registering of companies, we know she plays in that space. But what role is he playing in all these revocation process? Distinguished gentleman and distinguished lady, I appreciate your time so much. Thank you. Reverend, let me, let me first start with you in trying to get some deeper understanding. Again, in refreshing our minds, how we got here. Okay. So it was in November, um, I believe the 8th of November, that we announced a list. And we actually gave detailed reasons for each of the 53 firms that we had revoked their licenses. But let me say that this revocation followed a number of activities that we had engaged in with these companies because typically for a regulator a revocation uh, or the revocation decision is typically the last thing that you do in other words you give the companies enough uh, space if you like to resolve their issues so there were a number of regulatory breaches that these firms had um, you know, uh, committed, but mainly these firms were unable to return client funds. In other words, client funds had been locked up. Mm -hmm. And some of the things that we did, we organized hearings. During the hearings, we bring the complainants as a client and then the companies together for there to be, let's say, a payment plan agreed. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of the companies were failed to go by the payment plans. And before we came out with a revocation announcement, we actually wrote to all these companies and we gave them a final opportunity to make the case why um, you know, they shouldn't lose their license or demonstrate to us the ability to resolve the issues that at the time remain uh, unresolved. They failed to make the case for their licenses not to be revoked. So then we came up with a revocation uh, announcement on the 8th of November. Uh, fast forward, after the revocation announcement, uh, eight of the firms decided to appeal against the revocation decision uh, through the Administrative Hearings Committee, which is a provision that the Securities Industry Act uh, 2016, Act 929, uh, allows. Eight of them appealed, five were not successful, three were successful. So the net position is that 50 fund managers um, have lost their, um, their licenses to operate as fund managers. So what we had to do to protect investors, um, mm. you know, and also protect, if you like, the integrity of the mm. market was, uh, number one, we had to notify the Registrar General, um, who is official liquidator, uh, to go to court to petition the court for liquidation orders. We had to do this because uh, with our act, the only legal option available to us is a liquidation pathway. So we had to notify the Registrar General to go to court to seek for liquidation orders for these uh, firms. Then secondly, we appointed an agent to receive claims from affected clients mm -hmm. of these firms and then to acknowledge the claims. That's the first thing we asked them to do. Then the second thing we asked them to do was to go through a validation process. Because the fact that a claim has been received doesn't necessarily mean that that claim is valid. Okay? And we need to establish that the rightful claimant 
are making the right claims. Mm. So we mandated the agent, uh, that is PwC, uh, after receiving the claims and sending acknowledgement text, we mandated them to begin the validation uh, process. I'll give you an update on mm. how far we've mm. gone with that. Mm. Then mm. the next thing we did was to engage the government through the Ministry of Finance to look at how government can throw in a bailout package. You recall, George, that when we came up with the revocation announcement, what mm. we did say in our communication was that government was going to give a capped uh, amount to investors. We've done a lot of en engagements. The position has shifted, and it's a better position, mm. where the government has agreed to uh, provide the bailout on the validated mm. claims mm. of the affected uh, mm. investors. Reverend, I'll be coming to get more details on them, but I, I think that in your submission, you made a very critical point about going there, having a different pathway. Correct. And a lot of people have tried to compare your pathway to what happened in the case of the Bank of Ghana as well. Why didn't we all, you are all regulators, come in, pre-finance, and then why were you going this pathway that you brought Madame in that we knew her to be doing <laughs> uh, legal stuff when it comes to registration because I'll be coming very soon to you to tell me her role in all these things. But we know her as a registrar of companies. So why do you bring her into this whole mix in liquidation and dealing with these companies and all the rest? Okay. So all of these, um, you know, if like agencies, state agencies or regulators uh, have to work with enabling acts. Now, the Enabling Act would uh, prescribe, you know, the powers that the uh, agency or the regulator in this case would have. So Bank of Ghana um, principally works with, um, you know, Act 930. Mm. Um, and then we, the Securities and Exchange Commission, we work with Act 929. Okay. Now, if you look at the provisions in these two different acts when it comes to the issue about uh, dealing or resolving failed entities, um, there are differences. Mm. So Bank of Ghana worked with their enabling act and we had to work with our enabling act. Bank of Ghana, as you would know, uh, they appointed a receiver, uh, you know, as soon as they did the revocation uh, announcements mm. because the, 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 the act gives them that um, pathway mm. okay in our act we don't have the um, pathway for uh, a receiver for fund management companies oh, okay. uh, in our act we have the ability to appoint a receiver for broker dealers okay okay but when it comes to fund management companies uh, the the legal option we have in our act is to notify the uh, official liquidator to begin uh, the process of uh, liquidation, which involves petitioning the court for the orders. Once the orders are granted, then she goes through the next phase. So it's really about using what the act, the enabling act, using the provisions uh, in the enabling act to operate. So, so that is what it is. And I think people should understand that um, we have to work <laughs> within the framework uh, provided uh, by our enabling act. So that's what we did, notify the of, uh, official liquidator uh, to go to court for the liquidation mm -hmm. petition. Robin, I'll be coming back to you for concerns about whether you give maybe a Georgia company an ample time to address all the concerns. But Madam Jimo Mawari, I mean, I was talking about the fact that when it comes to registering companies and all those legalese and all the rest, but they came to you per the law and they, they needed your services. So what role are you playing in all these things? And is this something that you were, let me loosely use the word, willing to do or by the, the law requires, so maybe you had to do it? Exactly that, George. I had no other option than to act upon the request from the Securities and Exchange Commission when they wrote to me 11th of November, 2019, informing me about the revocation of the licenses of 53 fund management companies. Bear in mind that the Registrar General is also the official liquidator. That is the catch. And we gave life to these 53 fund management companies first as In terms of registering, right? First as companies, okay. yes. We incorporated them, we gave them commencement certificates. 
but it became clear that their objects had to do with a, a certain market that's the capital market and so they needed to go to Securitization Commission to get a license to be regulated by them. Mm. I give you life, but when it gets to regulation, it's a different institution. Mm -hmm. And so when their licenses were revoked, what that meant was they didn't have the right to operate in that particular market anymore. Okay. And so as the originator of life, you, I can also then kill you. Mm. You yes. give life, you take it back. Yes, no, I take right. it back because... I gave you life to do a particular function. That license that gave you that power has been taken away. You cannot remain on my books doing something else. Mm. And so the law too is very clear. And the, it, it was initially the body's corporate official liquidations act. That was as far back as 2019. But you know, 2020, there's a new act that has been passed okay, yeah. that governs insolvency and liquidations. The Corporate Restructuring Insolvency Act. So now that particular act empowered me to go to court because if you look in that act, by um, SEC was neither a member of a company or a creditor of a company mm. or a contributor of a company. It's very specific. Those are the only people who can petition me as an official liquidator to wind up the company because mm. they could have said, Registrar General, wind them up straight away. Mm. But I couldn't do that. I needed to go to court on my own motion under the same act to petition the courts to rather grant me orders to wind up those companies. And that took a long time. Mm. So from 11 November, the, these petitions were, and I am empowered under the same act to appoint external solicitors mm. to assist me with this liquidation. So I did that. So we petitioned the courts, but what happened was they were scattered in almost every court yeah. with adjournments upon adjournments. And we really needed to put a, the timelines down. So I appealed to the judicial service and got a single court to handle all the petitions. Mm. And so by May of 2020, I got my first order. That is where I came in. And clearly, it's a process. Currently, we just have 22 orders drawn up. We, ha we are liquidating 50 for now. He will inform you why. Initially, it was 53, mm. and it came down to 50. Mm. But for now... We are petitioning the cause for 50 fund management companies. I only have 22 currently. Right. Yes, okay. it's not enough just to have an order from the courts and then you, you, you just go to sleep. I need to publish it to the whole world. That's the gazette. I gazette it and inform the whole world that this company is going to be liquidated. Mm. And that is official liquidation. You know, we also have private liquidation. The company by itself, through its members, can write to us through a resolution and inform us mm. that they want to liquidate themselves because their company doesn't, they don't owe that many people, but they are not doing well. They want to get off the register. Mm. They mm. can appoint an auditor, but currently under the new act, they will appoint what we call an insolvency practitioner mm. to assist them to privately liquidate. Why did yeah. you have to go through this court route? Because was it because you wanted to access their data or you need that legal covering to do what you had to do? I cannot wind them up on my own steam. No. As I told you, in the act, I needed a member of these fund management companies to petition me okay. to wind up the company or a creditor. None of them petitioned me. A body known as Securities Action Commission petitioned me. And they are not part of the parties that can petition me. So I needed to go to the next step of petitioning the court myself and asking the court to wind them up because they were unable to pay their debts as it fell due. And those were one of the conditions I could petition the court for. Mm. So that was the ground upon which I went. Mm. And the courts therefore gave very impartial hearings. They gave the opportunity to respond to the petitions. Now, many of them didn't even accept the petitions. You need to also realize that. Yeah. Because they were not doing well in my books, they were not in good standing, they had even changed some of their directors and had not updated me. They had even moved office. Some had even closed down their offices and had not updated me in my register. When I keep on saying, file your annual returns, update me, this is what I mean. Mm. Inform me when directors change. Inform me when shareholders change. Inform me when the secretary changes. 
That was not being done by most of these fund management companies. Mm. So when we petitioned the courts and the bailiffs tried to serve them with a petition, some came back to say that we are no more directors of this company. Mm. Some the mobile numbers were just off. Some the offices were closed. So that took time. We had to do what do you, uh, what do you even what do you call substituted, uh, substituted service? We had to put this uh, petition in the papers before some of them responded to it, and so it, it really took a long time. So I'm saying I didn't have to, I didn't have any other option than to go through the route I went through through the courts. So now you have access to these companies. You are in the process of liquidating them, right? Yeah. For now, I only have 22 orders out of 50. Out of 50, yes. And what it means is that. Those others that I do not have orders for are still going through the court process. Mm. Mind the courts are on vacation now. So they are on vacation, yes. So mm. nothing is really happening to those other, you know, petitions until they resume. Reverend, let me bring you in. And there's <coughs> always been the argument about some players saying that we're not given fair hearing. How do you respond to that? Yeah. Respect to these fund management firms who are out there, and that is why some even sought to challenge the process in court. How do you respond to those concerns? George, I think the question that you may want to pose to, to such people is that, what do they mean by they were not giving a fair hearing? Let me give you some information. So out of the uh, 50 firms that we revoked their licenses, 21 of them, had actually ceased operations. Before you went in to, to take the action? Absolutely. So 21 of them were already, um, you know, has effectively stopped operations. Now, George, it would interest you to know that after we took the revocation uh, decision, we even had some of the employees of some of these firms who were in operation. You know, so there were 21 who were not in operation. And some of the employees of those who were in operation have come to say that uh, some for six months, some for 12 months, some for 18 months, they hadn't been paid. So, so clearly, those firms were in distress. But quite apart from that, in terms of the process, we, and I think I tried to explain at the, at the beginning, when uh, our on-site inspections, we pick up issues, uh, we will give you, write to you and in, give you some time to address those issues and I will come back to, to verify whether you've addressed those issues. Apart from that, when we receive complaints, especially where clients are not getting their monies back, we organize uh, DG hearings, that's what mm -hmm. we call it, where we bring the complainants and then we bring the companies to hear them. You know, and once the case is established, we, as if you like a moderator, we get the companies to agree to a payment plan mm. for the affected um, uh, a client. Many of these um, companies failed to, um, you know, uh, meet or go by the uh, payment plans agreed with the uh, customers um, under our uh, supervision. They mm. failed. Okay. There were a number of the firms who, uh, you know, indicated that they, they wanted to um, More time. In inject some, some uh, if you like, uh, capital or some liquidity. We said bring the plan uh, to, 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 to show us that you are able to do so. Mm. Because um, if you are in a liquidity crunch and you can inject some liquidity, that could give you, if you like, some uh, breathing space. And, um, you know, that also didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Okay. So after a series of hearings, after, after a series of engagement, then we wrote to them and said, we are giving you a final opportunity to deal or address or redress these issues. And we gave them some time to respond. Uh, they responded um, not satisfactory mm. uh, responses. And so we had to take the decision of um, revoking the licenses. So that's at our level. Now, after the, the revocation announcement, eight of the companies decided to use a provision in the Act, uh, Act 929, which is the Administrative Hearings Committee. Um, when you are not satisfied uh, with 
any issue or any decision within the securities industry, uh, the regulator that SEC has made a decision mm. you are not satisfied with. According to the act, the, the provision for the administrative hearings committee is there. Mm. As the director general, I'm not part of the um, you that accuse committee. Accuse yourself to ensure that there's no. Even fair. by by law, by law, you are not supposed I'm, I'm, to do yes, that. Yes, because. Okay. Uh, I, I have made a decision, of course, with the support of the board, uh, but the AHC sits without the executives being part of it, okay? So, the, and the AHC sitting is almost like a, a court sitting. So, we become, I think, the respondent. I think that's uh, how the, the law, lawyers will call it. So, we will become the respondent, and then the, so we, we, we are represented at mm. the AHC together with the companies that, um, uh, are, are appealing against the revocation decision. Mm -hmm. So that happened. Eight companies uh, did that. They were given ample opportunity to bring up any new evidence that would uh, overturn the revocation uh, decision. Now, only three were able to impress or convince the AHC with new evidence that they produced. So the AHC made a recommendation that um, you know the decision should be uh, you know reconsidered. Mm. So one had the license restored. Two, um, even though the license was restored, they were they, they were put on suspension mm. to meet certain mm. requirements. Mm. So only three out of the eight were successful. So wherein is the allegation that they were not given a, a fair hearing? Because mm. after the decision, the avenue of going to the AHC was available. They were given the opportunity, they made submissions of, there were some who even said that they needed access to their offices because when we took the decision, we had our agent lock up. So they told the AHC that, look, they need access to their offices in order to um, bring some additional information or new evidence. Mm. The access was granted, okay. Mm. Um, there was one particular company that even requested a change in the uh, procedure for the AHC, which was also accommodated. I'm just trying to tell you that the AHC accommodated those companies that came through with their So peers. I get from you that the, the, you gave everyone the fair hearing Absolutely. to ensure that it's Absolutely. done. Absolutely. We'll be getting back to get into the, the, the actual process about the government bailout and what Madame Jim Omar is also doing about the liquidation process. And for a lot of people out there, okay, so when do I get my money back? PM yeah. Express Business Edition, George, if you're looking at tracking the revocation process of the liquidation of these uh, more than 50 uh, fund management firms, Reverend Daniel Bavitete is the Director General of the Securities and Exchange Commission. Madam Jima Mawari is Registrar General of the Registrar General's Department. Getting more details about this, we'll take a short break and we'll be right back. This is PM Express. Welcome back to PM Express Business Edition. We're tracking the revocation process of these uh, fund management firms that lost their license to operate. We have the Director General of the Securities and Exchange Commission, Reverend Delo Gwamitete, and also the Registrar General, Madam Chimama Owari. Having these uh, two distinguished personalities to get more details on them on this whole process. Reverend, you were explaining to me about the process and the fact that I get from you that you give everybody the chance. Now, let's come back to one of the biggest questions that everybody's looking for to in terms of the pudding itself. And having gone through all these process, I go through your statement the other time and I, I was even educated myself. I get that in one breath, there is a government bailout. And in another breath, Madam Jima Mawari also comes in. I'll be coming to her for details on that, but help me out. Why are we having a government bailout? And then also, because people are still looking at the Bank of Ghana style of doing things, and you maybe help me in trying to distinguish between the two. Why everybody is saying that? Why can't you go the Bank of Ghana way in doing this thing, Reverend? Okay, so George, like I said, we are using the liquidation pathway. Now, when it comes to liquidation, and I'm happy uh, Mrs. Oware is here because she can um, give you more education on that, but typically with the liquidation pathway, after the liquidator 
in this case official liquidator, gets the liquidation orders. That gives her the power to take over the assets and the abilities. Uh, she'll go through some processes, engage the creditors, and then after all of that, she has to find assets that you know she can get some proceeds and out of which she would use to sort out all the creditors. So that's the process. So if the ability to trace the um, assets of the company is challenged or there are no <laughs> assets, you know, that will even impact how soon or how quickly she can uh, do anything for the uh, creditors. But at least what she would do would be to engage the creditors and explain to them the processes that she would go through. And then when she finds the proceeds, she has a certain um, you know, formula or hierarchy uh, that she would use to sort out all the creditors. Now, when we took the decision to revoke and being aware that we're using the liquidation pathway and knowing that the liquidation process can be long, especially mm. the angle of uh, getting some proceeds. So we engaged the government that these are investors and um, you know, we, we, our, our argument or our um, you know, uh, supplication, if I can use that mm, word, mm. was for government to uh, consider a bill out for the affected um, investors. So ahead Validated of claims. Or yes, so, so ahead of the, um, you know, whatever like the official liquidator would find, we are saying that government come in and provide a bailout for these investors or these clients of these affected companies. Initially, we, we, we government told us, okay, they'll give a capped amount, but over time and through co uh, engagement, the government has agreed to provide the bailout based on the validated claims of these uh, clients. Mm. So this is, if you like, uh, a social intervention that government has decided to do because typically... Whilst you wait for the assets to be validated and be sold, um, let me use the layman since I have a lawyer here, yeah. to sell the, the, the assets of these companies. Well, so actually the way the, the bailout is going to work, once government comes in, the clients don't even have to uh, be worried about engaging the official liquidator for any process because government mm -hmm. is coming to say if this uh, this is your validated claim we are providing you the bailout so the government will have to then deal with official liquidator in terms of whatever recoveries she would make from the assets she may find mm -hmm. okay so what government is doing is very good because it's effectively stepping in to make these affected While you uh, wait for investors whole. But Reverend, some will say that clearly from the Bank of Ghana experience, it was clear that this liquidation process would take quite a while to pay these people right. So that's why I said that we are working with our act in Act 19. I'm sorry if I threw in, no, because no, that is what no, I, we, fresh on our mind. No, it's, it's important. I think people need to understand. In Act 929, um, we can appoint a receiver only where broker dealer firms are concerned we can't ap appoint a receiver uh, where fund management, management companies are concerned so the companies that we revoked the license were fund management companies so the only legal option we had was to notify the registrar general to say that look you you you, you gave these people um you know a certificate to operate we gave them a license, we've taken away the license. The object for which they came for the registration is no longer valid because mm. we've taken our license. So please, liquidate them. So that is the pathway. And I think that um, we, if you compare oranges and apples, you're making, uh, you're Maybe getting it wrong. Yeah. We are working within the- The laws, uh, the laws. that guides your yeah. Udu Sopranda or whatever. Exactly, because that's my, my enabling act is Act 929, not Act 930. So mm. I must work with Act 929 and follow uh, you know, the provisions in mm. there. Mm. So the liquidation process is also another way. And, and that's why I'm saying that government is coming in because it's a long process. Mm. A government is coming in, government is saying that, okay, I want two conditions to be fulfilled. One, I want to see that you've got a liquidation order, and then two, I want to see that your claims have been validated. Once this is done, 
I'm not going to wait for the official liquidator to find assets, get proceeds out of the assets. I'm going to step in and make you mm. whole based mm. on your validated mm. claim. Mm. And I mm. will deal with the mm. Uh, mm. official mm. liquidity. Mm. I think this is a mm. very mm. great So, so Reverend, as we speak right now, how much has government provided in terms of the bailout? And uh, how have you also been established on, in terms of your validated claims and how do we work things out in this area, Reverend? Okay, so we appointed an agent, like I said, to receive the claims. And after that, after they had acknowledged, we asked them to do the validation. We had, or uh, let me say, our agent had full access, and I'm stressing the word full access, the records of 40 of the companies. Against 50. Okay, so let me, let me just do a, a little breakdown for you. So after the three companies were successful at the AHC, we are basically down to 50 companies. Oh, okay. Okay. Now, out of the 50 companies, three of them did not have any claims filed against them. Okay. Because operationally, they were in some kind of limbo. I mean, they hadn't mm. really... So, so we're actually dealing with the 47 companies that claims were filed against. Mm. I, I hope you get it. I get you. So three were restored. So we are 50. Out of the 53, did not have any claims. So we are talking about 47. Out of the 47, we had full access to the records of 40 of them. Okay. And for the 40 of them, validation has been 100% completed. Mm. We had partial access to one of them, and this is Black Shield or Gold Coast uh, mm. for that matter. Partial access. What do I mean by partial access? They gave our agent uh, data in Excel, and the data in Excel enabled the our agent to validate 2,275 claims. Now, the total number of claims filed against Black Shield was 82,204 claims. Mm. But they provided data in Excel, which was able to allow the, um, our, our agent to validate uh, you know, 2,275. Two That's just about 3%. Mm. So in the case of Black Shield, we had partial access. So um, it was only, I think, about two, three weeks ago that we were able to get the server. And even with that, we had to um, engage a law enforcement agency uh, you know, to um, retrieve the server which had the information. Mm. So our agent has gotten the server and has been able to take uh, the record from the server and is now um, you know, validating the remaining claims mm. where Black Shield is concerned. Mm. Then the other firm, um, First Bank, yeah. right after the relocation, uh, they were not cooperating. They went to court uh, to appeal again. They were asking for a judicial review. They were thrown out of court, but they've gone to, they're looking to appeal the decision and they filed an injunction against us. Uh, so in the case of First Bank, we do not have any access at all. Mm. So that's two on the 40. Mm. So that it will be remaining with five. Mm. Now the remaining five, there were, um, there were issues, a few issues, uh, I'll call them administrative issues, mm. including landlords uh, who were owed yeah. <laughs> uh, rent yeah. and yeah. locking up. We've gone through tho those and I can, uh, from the information I, I've got from the, um, the, our agent, uh, I think two of them, they are almost done. Uh, so that is on course. One of the remaining five was already in um, liquidation, that's EM Capital. Yeah, and yeah. the records are with the Madam, yeah. uh, registrar general. So the, the remaining five, <coughs> sorry, the re remaining five, you know, we are on course to uh, clear them. Gold Coast or Black Shield, we now have the records to do the validation of the remainder. First Bank, we don't have any access because mm. of uh, back and forth uh, legal uh, issues. The yeah. legal issues. So validation is done for okay. 40 of the firms. And I was saying that government said we need validation done, then we need to get liquidation orders. As Mrs. Owari said, the court has granted 22 liquidation orders. And that is why we are saying that phase one, we said it in the, in the press release, that phase yeah. one would cover the 22 um, firms that liquidation orders have been secured. And the good news is that their, um, their, um, their claims have also uh, been validated. Okay, mm. so um, that is the position. Yes, I think in the, in the press release, we also indicated uh, four of the companies that are in court. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, the determination of the court, those court 
uh, processes would also or can also impact on mm, mm. Uh, the time. But uh, of the four, two of them, their claims are already validated. That's mm. Apex and then um, uh, Apex Capital and then Ideal Capital. Mm. The other two, First Bank and Gold Shield, I think I've explained. First yeah. Bank, we don't yeah. have yeah. access. So, Reverend, I was trying to get some clarity from you on what you've been able to establish as the validated claims and what government is giving to us as a social uh, support. Okay, so George, let me start by saying that what government has agreed to do is to look at validated claims. Mm. Okay, so that's uh, the position. Now, in the case of the 22 firms that liquidation orders have been granted by the court, the total value of the claims filed against them um, came to 1.5 billion Ghana cities. The validated position of those claims is 1 billion and 80 million. Mm. Okay, so if you are talking about the um, the 22 firms, uh, what government is going to provide will be the um, the 1 billion and, and 80 because that's the validated claims. So that is the um, the the position. Uh, for the 40 firms that the validation uh, has been completed, the total value of claims that um, was filed against was about 4.9 billion. Mm. Okay, the validated position is about 3.4 billion. Mm. Okay, so that's a difference of about 1.5 there about. So, so we are dealing with, uh, I mean, you know, the issue of what is the validated position because mm. that's what government has agreed mm. uh, to do. The details of the payment will be communicated to um, the affected investors by the official liquidator because mm. official liquidator is managing the process. Mm. It's not SEC that uh, okay. it's mandated to okay. liquidate the okay. firms. Okay, so Reverend, just a quick education and wrap here. So government has done about a little over one point, this is something billion in terms of what they've been able to provide. What has been validated is about uh, four point something billion. Help me out, uh, just clarity on this. So I'm saying that for the 40 companies, yeah. we received claims totaling about 4.9 billion. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the validated position is 3.4 billion. That's for the 40 companies. Yeah. Okay. These 22 companies are in this mm. 40 companies. And for the 22 companies, the value of claims filed against them is 1.5 billion. Mm. But the validated claims for these 22 companies, 1 billion and 80 million. Mm. Okay. Uh, but what all I'm saying is that the commitment we have from government is that they would provide funds um, based on the validated claims. So mm. for these 22 firms, what it means is that it's a billion and 80 uh, million that government would release uh, in terms of the bailout mm. and, and is that ready some will say oh that's what i'm saying that okay. you know the so um, registrar general will communicate <laughs> um, and it will be uh, maybe you're trying to get <laughs> a lot more information but there'll be a component that w we call it a liquid component mm. i think in the press release we, 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 we have yeah. said it a liquid component and then an investment component okay. but the details will be communicated so let me come back to the registrar uh, general madam uh, when she meets the, uh, creditors. the creditors so uh, first let me also get from you that as we speak right now where are we in terms of this whole liquidation process if you could help us out madam okay thank you very much george I initially mentioned that the courts had granted 22 orders for 22 firms out of the 40 firms that DG is mentioning. Even of the 22 orders, the laws require that I gazette the orders before I begin any process. And the courts have drawn up for me only 21 orders. Before we put out the notices for the first creditor meetings, I only had 20 orders that I had gazetted. That is how come my first creditor meeting is going to only deal with 20 of those firms for now. When we gazette it in the, in the, in the commercial industrial bulletin or the, at assembly press, it normally takes a week or two before the gazette actually comes out. The next step is within six weeks after the order has been granted us from the courts, we are supposed to publish a notice to creditors and debtors to submit claims for us to prove or validate. Luckily, as soon as 
DG revoked or SEC revoked the license of all these firms. They didn't wait for my process to begin. As he explained, they quickly appointed an agent. And all those claims of all these fund management companies were submitted to this agent who quickly validated 40 of them. So at this level, even though I've put the notice out, as the law requires for me to put it out, most of the claims have been validated and submitted. All those out there who, for one reason or the other, didn't submit claims to PW, the agent, yeah. can submit to our department. We will forward it to the agent. The same agent will be my agent who will validate the claim. So there's not going to be any problem. Yeah. Whether they receive it or we receive it, that will be done. Yeah. After the proof of death, which has already been done really, the next stage is for me to get the members of the company or the officers of the company or the accountants or anybody who has knowledge about the company to give the agent information about the company to prepare what we call the statement of affairs. Mm. The statement of affairs basically is, is giving information on the status of the company just before liquidation. You need to tell these creditors, first of all, how did we even get to this point? That statement of affairs has to come from whoever is associated with the company. Mm. And I'm talking of directors or shareholders or auditors. And basically, they'll be giving us information on the assets and liabilities of the company mm. just before liquidation. Mm. They'll also give us any arrangements, any assets that have been secured, maybe charges have been raised against any of these assets. So the liquidator would necessarily have to secure, pay after I liquidate. And if those assets have been secured, that means the creditors will not get any monies from these assets. If there's a, a charge against an asset, say a house, if I sell it, all those money should go towards the payment of that creditor who secured mm. their investment with that particular mm. company. Mm. All the other kind of information has to be given to me. Mm. Not only that, the directors or the shareholders have to give me a statement as to why they went into insolvency. Mm. So that before I meet these creditors, which is what I'm going to be discussing, I need to tell them something. Mm. But some will say all of that things being equal with all these processes and all the rest, when are we going to start the process of okay. saying that, George, you have you've done the validation, I've finished with this creditors meeting, uh, then the legal information and all the rest too. Just like what you did with the DKM, when yes. we were all excited when you started the payment, uh, when are we hoping that from we'll this period this. we will start making the payment process? Okay. I put out a notice in the dailies on the 1st of September in the Daily Graphic and the Ghanaian Times that I'm going to start for the first time, I haven't done this before, virtual first creditor meetings. Why? Because we are in a very unusual situation, COVID-19. I cannot meet this large numbers because of the social distancing. And so we are talking of 20 firms for now. I have put out a schedule of the different dates from Feb from September 7th to September 11th. Mm. Every day I'll be having at least three or four companies. I've slotted specific times for them. And I'm going to use Zoom, the Zoom platform, and they will have to log on with a link I'll give to them. And I'm going to send them SMS to their various mobile numbers that the agent collated for me. It is turning out that some of these firms didn't give the right mobile number. So many of them have not received the SMS I sent. Creditors are also inclusive of investors. I have suppliers who are also creditors. I have debtors. I have firm, I mean, how do I say, creditors such as the GRE, workers, utility companies, all those are preferred creditors if, you, if it gets to declaring a dividend and distributing it to them. But they are not investors mm. and the bailout will not affect them. Mm. Mm. So I would necessarily need to have the first creditors meeting, explain the processes to them and then have the class meeting separately for the investors of the fund management companies mm. which the bailout would affect. Mm. All those others who do not fall in the bailout, I'll use the assets of the companies and declare dividend 
and pay to them on pari pasu basis. So you're looking at somewhere, uh, maybe possibly last week in September, maybe. Yes, because m this next week is second week of September. The week after, I have to do the class meetings, definitely. And then the week after, the payments from the bailout should start for the investors. Mm. So before the end of September, we should be paying the first set of Madam, I'll be coming back investors. to you and Reverend about in having a very seamless process with all these payments and also going for a Reverend lessons learned and how do we ensure that we don't get back to this place again. This is PM Express Business Edition. We are tracking this whole recovocation process and as you hear from them, some good news in terms of the payment being made. But what are the lessons that we've learned? How are we going to ensure that this payment process will be quite seamless without any stress, challenges, in terms of those who are paying and those who are receiving. This PM Express Business Edition will be right back after this break. Welcome back to PM Express Business Edition as we track this whole revocation process of these fund management firms out there and how do we ensure that they get their monies for the depositors of these investors. You've heard a lot from Reverend Daniel Bamitata, Director General of the Securities and Exchange Commission and also the Registrar General, Madam Jimaya Mawari, explaining things to us as well. So, Madam, before we went for the break, you were explaining to us about what possible period you're looking at you starting the process. What are you also putting in place to ensure that this payment process become as smooth as possible? Because for some people out there, they are just waiting for that call or text message about when I can walk into the bank and get my money. The class meeting will break down the information further as to how they can access their monies. Definitely, we're going to set up a website. We're putting a lot of stuff virtually. And so you're going to be linking it through our various websites. I have a whole procedure put out there. You have to, of course, submit your claim electronically. You have to sign off before we will be able to maybe give you a bank account number that you should get mm -hmm. your money. It's going to be seamless, I mm -hmm. promise you. Madam, you what benefit. happens to those who might have lost out in this whole process and have not had their claims being validated? What happened to... A draw man so had about maybe just uh, 5,000 Ghana cities or 10,000 Ghana cities with one of these firms and then she didn't know about what was going on. Is there still a process for a draw man to have her 10,000 Ghana cities back? Yes, there is. DG informed you that up till now, even though we gave a specific time, normally when you put out the notice for submission of proof of debts, it's a month. Mm. It's, it's time, time bound. But in this case, we are still receiving claims. As mm. of yesterday, we were still receiving claims, even after they thought it had ended with the agent that SEC appointed. So we will take claims as long as you are really an investor of these fund management companies. And also, we will only see to you unless your claim is validated. Mm, mm. Yes. And I get from you that it would be a mix of uh, cash and investment. That is, uh, what, that is what DG said, mm -hmm. yes. Reverend, um, help us in that sense about the bit about it being a mix of cash and then. So are you going to be born to investment papers or what? What we are currently uh, considering is to use um, a special purpose vehicle mm. uh, that... Um, uh, you know, a mutual fund that would be uh, would have the liquid component and then the investment component. Uh, so the liquid component means that you can actually um, take it as you know cash. You know, the idea is to use a capital market instrument, instrument. Um, in <coughs> in, the, in 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 managing the the the, the payout mm -hmm. or the bailout. So so that's really what it is. So and if if you know mutual funds, you know that. One of the attractiveness of mutual funds is the ability to provide liquidity. Mm. Okay, so we are using uh, that vehicle, a capital market um, vehicle for that. But, but more details would be made available to the um, investors Invest. during the class meetings. Meeting. She explained that she'll have creditor meetings, but then when she gets to the class meetings, that's with the investors uh, or the clients. So then she would really get into 
the structure of the, the vehicle. So um, just hold your horse <laughs> and when she gets to that stage, all mm -hmm. the nitty gritty of the vehicle that will be used uh, would be paid. I think the most important thing to note is that uh, government has moved from the position of just giving a capped uh, amount to saying that we'll look at your validated claims and then um, you know give you um, you know the money based on that. I mean the fact is that a lot of these uh, clients actually mm. invested mm. so the intention was to invest of mm. course for certain outcomes you mm. know so um the the vehicle that will be used would mm. would be supportive mm. of uh, the, the the needs of investors. Reverend, finally as i wrap up on you and also come to madam Dumawari, what are you doing finally on that to ensure that we don't get to this place again as in sec wrapping up in your final thoughts please yeah so you know i i, I think um i gave a speech at the gimpa law faculty recently yeah. and uh, at the conference and i mentioned uh, five uh, if you like key sources leading to where we are today for instance i talked about structural issues we had a situation where financial conglomerates emerged so they have a license with uh, the bank of ghana they have a license with um, sec and so on and so forth and you know if you like coordination between the regulators wasn't what it should be. That problem has been taken care of because the Financial Stability Council has been established by law. And so all the four regulators in the financial sector, we are talking more often, we are uh, working together more closely. We are even considering things like even some form of joint uh, supervision and so on and so forth, for in information sharing. So, um, you know, that, you know, if you like, gap because you know it led to what we, what we call regulatory arbitrage mm. and people were ex exploiting that has been closed then i also talked about conduct issues you know conduct where market um the market operators were doing things that uh, they shouldn't have done they were mm. mis-selling uh, mm. some were actually engaging in fraudulent activities mm. and there was commingling of uh, operational funds with client funds mm. you know a, a number of things you know in our industry we our maxim is my word is my bond mm. but that was not the case we have come out with conduct of business guidelines that addresses um, you know some of these issues in terms of how the operators are expected mm. uh, to operate mm. then we can also talk about governance issues it mm. was clear that some of these firms, you know, their boards were uh, not effective, mm. both from composition of the boards to even operationalization of the boards, in the sense mm. that boards are effective when they, for instance, have subcommittees. Mm. You find that that, okay. that was okay. missing. Um, and then in our space, farm managers are supposed to work with investment committees mm. uh, to, uh, if you like, assess the investment proposals made by the farm managers. That was also another. So again, we have uh, the conduct of business uh, guidelines will deal with All board, board compositions yeah. and, and, and so on and so mm. forth. Then there's the issue of financial literacy or the lack of financial literacy okay. because people didn't understand uh, what investment is. Let me tell you something. There's a trade-off between risk and return. Okay. Uh, when you have high return, that goes with high risk. Mm -hmm. But people didn't understand that. So they, they were not aware that they were, um, you know, in chasing returns or chasing mm -hmm. rates, they were exposing themselves, you know, to, um, you know, high risk. We, we need to intensify mm -hmm. um, a lot of I investor education there. Then lastly, let me talk about regulatory issues because, mm -hmm. you know, people always want to say that regulator, you had a role to play, you know, mm -hmm. what, uh, do, you know, don't, you know, if you like, <laughs> put the blame on others. Of course, we have looked at our, 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 our system. One of the areas that we are taking another look at is our licensing framework. Okay. Because it's the license that would even permit anyone to come and operate Give in the industry in, room, yeah. in the first place. So we, we have tightened the licensing requirements. We actually will be issuing new licensing guidelines, which raises the bar. For instance, 
you know, the minimum capital required for farm managers, um, you know, till now or until we pass that our new licensing requirements is 100,000 Ghana cities. 100,000 mm -hmm. Ghana cities, um, George Uyafi and Co. can easily uh, 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 come up <laughs> with it. So uh, w we are looking at making the, um, the licensing um, regime more robust. So we'll be issuing out the guidelines uh, okay. in, in, the, in the coming weeks. We're also strengthening our... Uh, supervision on site and then off site. We are looking at the risk based supervision uh, framework, uh, you know, to make it tighter. Then finally, we have been operating a very manual system and we have also launched a digitization program to make it easy and quicker for the uh, market operators to submit information to the commission and also make the analytics of the information um, that's uh, submitted quicker and faster, mm. throwing up early warning signals and all that. So basically, we're looking at how to tighten the, uh, uh, our capacity as a regulator to maintain that oversight of mm. the industry. So we, we are putting mm. all these things in mm. place, and we mm. trust that mm. uh, it, it, it would help to strengthen the, um, the, market. the, the market, and we, d we shouldn't see uh, this thing recurring again. But I'm going worry, in a minute, uh, your final words as we wrap up the show. Well, as a follow-up to all that he said, most of these companies were not in good standing in my records mm -hmm. in the sense that they had not filed their annual returns up to date and updated us. That is my song I've been singing for so long. They had not updated us on changes that had taken place in the company. That is why when we got to service, we couldn't even find some of their offices. They had moved offices without informing us. Basically, from what I've said, going forward, you have to be linked up with me through this uh, virtual platform so if you don't get any message by Sunday, it means that you'll be out of this whole thing. You'll not get to know whatever mm -hmm. I'm offering you. Mm -hmm. So please, they should take the number seriously and get back to us. And once we link up through this uh, link I'll give to them, I believe that they'll be able to get the satisfaction they need. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a long process, mm -hmm. clearly. I mean, liquidation is not, um, you can see from the processes, it's taking so long. But when it gets to the bailout, what the fund management need to know is that if your your company that you have an uh, investor of doesn't get the liquidation order, they will not even be considered. Okay. So those fund management companies that are fighting us in court and are still not able to pay their invest investors, they should just, you know, stop the whole process. Because at the end of the day, without that liquidation order, you can't even get those claims validated to get the bailout. Mm. And then your, your investors are suffering. Mm. And they wouldn't understand why some are getting a bailout and they are out there. And if you think about it, one of the companies is the one that has about 80% mm. of the claims. And that person is out of this whole thing we're doing. Mm. So it's important that they understand the processes. Registered General you know, Madam Jimaya Mawari, I appreciate your time so much. Reverend and Logba Mitete. It's quite difficult to get these uh, two giants to sit at the table and have a discussion as we try to uh, track the revocation process. Well, all too soon we have to draw the curtain down on PM Express Business Edition, tracking the revocation process with the Director General of the Securities and Nation Commission, Reverend Daniel Ogbami Tete, and also Madam Jima Mawari, Registered General, helping us, the legalese, and breaking down the issues for you and I. Well, all too soon we have to draw the curtain down. It's been PM Express Business Edition. Have a great day.